Hey everyone, it's Lily again from Socio Scholar. Now that I'm in Germany, I thought I should seize the opportunity to explore the country. Apart from the famous Altbier, the band Kraftwerk, the world famous Dusseldorf Mustard, and Dusseldorfer Carnival, Dusseldorf holds a special place for sociologists and philosophers as the birthplace of Jurgen Habermas. So while I'm here, I'll delve into his ideas and contributions. Make sure to check out our previous lesson if you haven't already, as it lays the foundation for today's discussion and will help you understand the topics I'm covering today better. Let's go. Habermas, who is thought to be the most important German philosopher of the second half of the 20th century, was born in 1929, here in Dusseldorf. He lived through the dark times of World War II, and this pretty much shaped his later intellectual journey. He studied philosophy and sociology at the universities of Göttingen and Bonn, and later earned his Ph.D. at the University of Bonn in 1954. His Ph.D. dissertation was about the conflict between the absolute and history in Friedrich Schelling's philosophy. However, the turning point for Habermas's academic journey was when he became involved with the Frankfurt School and its founders. From 1956 to 1959, Habermas was the first assistant to Theodore Adorno at the Institute for Social Research. In this role, Habermas was deeply influenced by the school's critical theory, honing his ideas on social justice, communication, and democracy. In the late 1960s, he became the director of the Institute, where his influence led to notable shifts in the trajectory of critical theory. Unlike most of his contemporaries, Habermas has tried to keep up with the current affairs and has never shied away from voicing his political opinions. For example, he endorsed the Persian Gulf War in 1991 for its role in protecting Israel and supported NATO's bombing of Serbia in 1999 because he thought it was necessary to prevent ethnic genocide. But he was a vocal critic of the Iraq War in 2003, calling it unnecessary and illegal. At the time of making this video, he is 94 years old, but still roaring and making headlines. The most recent fuss he has made was in 2021, when he turned down the Sheikh Zayed Book Award, worth 225,000 euros. He initially accepted the honor, but later declined it because of his concerns about the political and human rights situation in the United Arab Emirates. His latest book, titled Also a History of Philosophy, was published in 2019. It examines the origins of today's dominant forms of Western post-metaphysical thought. Habermas's engagement with critical theory has been both contributing and critical. While his thought system has been shaped by the school's foundational ideas, he has also injected fresh perspectives that has shaken its very foundations. For example, Habermas criticized the earlier generation of critical theory particularly the work of Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer, for their overly pessimistic view of reason and modernity. Habermas argued that they did not offer a constructive or practical path forward and that they missed the liberating potential of modernity. He tried to revise critical theory to emphasize the potential for rational communication to overcome social issues and foster democracy, equality, and justice. Habermas also tried to distance himself from the earlier Frankfurt School's strong reliance on the ideas of Marx and Freud. Now let's go through some of the key concepts and ideas of the star of today's show. Communicative rationality, a foundational concept introduced by Habermas, underscores the ability of individuals to achieve a shared understanding through rational discourse. It's not just about exchanging information, but involves critical discussions where individuals evaluate and interpret each other's perspectives to arrive at a mutual agreement. Now, closely related to this is the idea of communicative action. It's the process where people actively engage in dialogues centered around communicative rationality to shape their social realities. In communicative action, it's not just talk. It's about conversations that lead to consensus facilitating social integration and cooperation. These rational dialogues that facilitate understanding are not limited to private conversations. They find their stage in what Habermas identifies as the public sphere. The public sphere is a neutral space, free from the influences of the state and economic powers, where individuals gather to discuss, debate, and shape public opinion. 
It is here that communicative rationality and communicative action come alive, guiding societal norms and decisions, ensuring they represent the collective consensus, reach through informed and rational dialogues. Following the rational dialogue and consensus in the public sphere, Habermas introduces the contrasting ideas of system and life world. The system consists of the formal structures and mechanisms in society, such as the political and economic institutions, which are governed by strategic actions and power relations rather than communicative action. These are the realms where decisions are often made not through consensus, but through power and institutional control. On the other hand, life world involves the informal, cultural, and social aspects where people's shared beliefs, values, and understandings exist. It's the space where communicative rationality and communicative action take place. However, a conflict arises when the system invades life world, a phenomenon Habermas refers to as the colonization of life world. This happens when the formal, strategic, and instrumental logics of the system invades the life world undermining the natural processes of communicative action and rational discourse. The system's logic limits the life world, causing social integration to suffer and reducing the potential for democracy. Habermas understands this conflict between the system and life world as the central challenge of maintaining real democratic spaces in the modern world. It's time to bookmark my lesson and stamp my passport as I bid adieu to Germany. But before catching my flight, I'd like to close this lesson by reviewing what Habermas's critics have to say about his ideas. A group of critics have argued that Habermas's ideas, especially his theory of communicative action and discourse ethics, are overly complex and idealistic. They argue that the level of rationality and ideal speech situation that he suggests is often not achievable in real-world social and political contexts. Also, Habermas's model has been criticized for not sufficiently considering the influence of power dynamics in communicative action. Critics suggest that power imbalances can significantly affect the process of reaching a consensus, as those with more power can influence the outcome. Also, in reality, the public sphere can be fragmented, with multiple competing publics and discourses. Besides, the accessibility and inclusivity of the public sphere are often hampered by social inequalities and power structures as we have seen through history. Another group of critics have pointed out that Habermas's theories are not as universal as he claims and that they are steeped in Eurocentric norms and values, potentially limiting their applicability to non-Western contexts. They argue that the notions of the public sphere and communicative action are grounded in Western democratic traditions and Enlightenment ideals. All right, now you've got the scoop on Habermas and his big ideas. I'm heading home to prepare our next lesson, which will be on neo-Marxism and its prominent thinkers. It's going to be the grand finale of our Marxism and Critical Theory series, but stay tuned. A new series is just around the corner. If you found this lesson useful, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with friends, family, or anyone you believe would benefit. Catch you later.